I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 59 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 059. Now, the gun of the show for this episode is the Ruger LCR LG. This is the LCR N38 Special with a laser grip attached to it. Now, one thing I want to mention is that I had been carrying this gun about a week before I took it and did this picture. So, you'll see a little bit of dirt and grime in the picture if you're looking at it on the Instagram or YouTube video. And by Instagram, I mean the Instagram photo, which I still need to upload. But anyways, I fell in love with Ruger's LCR when I dry fired this one. And by this one, I mean the one I'm talking about and the one that's in the video on the YouTube video and in the Instagram photo. But I fell in love with it when I dry fired it in the gun store. And the fact that it had a Crimson Trace laser grip made it even better. I noticed the trigger did not stack like many of the double action only revolvers do, nor did it feel gritty. After actually firing it, I noticed that there was a notable lack of felt recoil. And that made the gun even more pleasant to shoot than my Smith 442. Which for a light gun, that's actually a pretty good gun to shoot. Now the balance on this one is a little odd, but... You know, it's very functional when you get used to it, and I also suspect that it contributes to the lack of felt recoil you experience with this particular gun. Now, a lot of people do attribute the lack of felt recoil to the polymer grip frame, and I admit that's probably a big part of it, but I also suspect that there are other design features in play on that feature as well. And by on that feature, I mean the lack of felt recoil. You know, another feature I really like about this one is the shape of the cylinder reminds me of the old pepper box revolvers that, well, if you go back and you look in the old shooting or in the old uh, firearms from the West, you'll see that they had the barrel and the cylinder all as one piece on some of the revolvers. It was way around Samuel Colt's patent. Now, the pepper boxes were inherently dangerous, and actually they were, in some ways, they were actually safer than the they were safer than the Colt versions, but at the same time, they weren't. They were bulky, they were cumbersome, and they were difficult to use, too. And someday I may go back and do a history on some of these guns, but we'll, we'll save that for later. In fact, I need to get back with our friends from Come and Take It, the podcast, not the gun rights group, and talk to them about doing such an episode. But that's a future thing. Now, the Ruger LCR was likely the first polymer-framed revolver on the market. It was definitely the most popular polymer-framed revolver on the market, even today. Now, this is due to the existing popularity of the 38 Special cartridge, and that same popularity of the 38 Special also prevented this gun from creating an ammunition short shortage, like its semi-auto relative, the LCP, did with the 380 Auto. Now, I also suspect the LCR has had much lower sales numbers than the LCP, which also contributed to the lack of an ammo shortage in 38 Special. The LCR product line has expanded since this model was introduced, and now there are models that feature an external hammer, different calibers, and there's a model that has an adjustable rear sight along with a 3-inch barrel. Most models are available from the manufacturer with a Hogue Tamer monogrip, or with a set of Crimson Trace laser grips like the one I have. Now, the one I have is a model number 5402 in Ruger's catalog. It is chambered for the 38 Special Plus P, has a capacity of five rounds, and as I said, it is a double-action-only revolver. The sights, well, the rear sight is an integral notch, while the front is, it's a replaceable pinned-on front sight. The materials are, that this is made out of include a polymer grip frame, an aluminum cylinder frame, as well as a stainless steel barrel and cylinder. Now it weighs in at only 14 ounces. However, the MSRP is not quite so lightweight. MSRP on this one is $825. Keep in mind, MSRP is always a bit higher, and at the time you're listening to this podcast, the MSRP may have changed from the time I recorded it. Now with that said, let me run the audio clip that tells you how to get the show, and after that I'll come right back and, well... I'll talk to you a little bit about why I took the week off. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Now, last week I took the 
week off and did not release an episode. And this was all unannounced because, well, I didn't have time to develop an episode that I felt was adequate. And I also felt that an evergreen episode was not a good fit considering the political environment and the fact that I had been super busy with work, the excessive rainfall, and all that other stuff kind of contributed to the whole mess. Also, the fact that I kind of had my workstation where I processed the audio tore apart for some repairs didn't help matters. Now, one thing I have been working on besides this is a while back, I was involved in an off-road group. They kind of folded, and I still talk to the president of that group from time to time, but that's not what I'm, that's not really what was tying my time up. A project I was going to work with him on that I never really gave up on is what I've kind of got in mind. You see, I am working on another podcast that, if I can get it together, will be an automotive-centric podcast, and, well, it's still... There's still a lot of planning and stuff going on behind the scenes that I'm not 100% set on yet, but let me say that that took up a significant portion of my time last week as well. I could have released one of the two evergreen episodes I've got, but all the audio clips in them are out of date. They, and you know, I could do better on them now, so I just didn't release them. In fact, I'll probably go back, delete them, and re-record them. You know, let's just drop this and run the audio clip that tells you about the social media, and then we'll come back and talk about House Bill 910. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Well, House Bill 910 passed the Senate on the third reading. And there's some talk whether or not it'll be going back to the House for another vote or if it's good for the Senate. It all hinges on the nature and the content of the Huffines Amendment. Now, I don't believe this is confidential information, and I'm going to go ahead and mention it. But my understanding was that the Huffines Amendment, well, let me go back to the Huffines Amendment and describe the Huffines Amendment. The Huffines Huffines Amendment is the amendment that restored the Dutton Amendment which was stripped out in the Senate committee. Now, my understanding is that the Dutton Amendment had to be stripped out as part of a deal for the House to pass, or for the Senate to pass House Bill 910, and in return, the Senate would pass Senate Bill, or the House would pass Senate Bill 11. But without stripping the Dutton Amendment, or after stripping the Dutton Amendment and having the same or similar language, and I'm not sure what the situation on that is yet, added back in with the Huffines Amendment, that deal may be in jeopardy or dead. I hope it's not dead. I hope we get campus carry with Senate Bill 11, and I hope the House passes it, but they may not. And they may add in something to strip Senate Bill, or in Senate Bill 11, they may add in an an amendment to strip the Dutton Amendment out again. I don't know. Now, House Bill... 19 was passed on its second and third readings in the House. But while it was in the House committee, it was there was a committee substitute that replaced it with what was essentially the same text as in Senate Bill 17, which means this bill would not be effective until January 1st of 2016. And this was done so that the DPS has time to train instructors on retention and open carry. It does not do away with concealed carry. It does not regulate the carrying of long guns, nor does it require a separate license as reported by some news outlets, including the Christian Science Monitor. Now, this bill does require a belt or shoulder holster for open carry. Definitions for these are not provided. However, as long as the holster attaches to a belt, it should qualify as a belt holster. A retention holster is not required, but it's recommended, and the state-required class will teach about retention holsters as well. There is no requirement in this bill for current CHLs to take a class or renewed in order to be able to open carry. Now, an attorney general's opinion could possibly change that, and the DPS could try to claim a regulatory power that does not exist to force open carry classes onto current CHL holders. I don't know if that's the case, but it's possible. But it's also doubtful that any such effort will be made. Let me just say that. Regarding signage requirements, well... There were some minor changes to 30-06 from current law that was basically to differentiate it from, to make it apply only to concealed carry, and 
to reduce the violation to a Class C misdemeanor. It also, this bill also creates a 30-07 sign, which is required to ban openly carried handguns by license holders. And then you also have the fact that generic signage will effectively ban the carrying of long guns, which is unchanged from current law. Now, a license holder will have to carry both license and ID when carrying, just as they do under current law. Requirements and eligibility remain the same for open and concealed carry. The bill was amended so that nursing homes are now referenced as nursing facilities. And it was amended so that peace officers cannot stop and demand, stop or detain so that they can demand ID solely because the person being detained or stopped is open carrying. Now, the Huffines Amendment, which is what put this back into the bill, is reportedly identical to the Dutton Amendment, which put it in the bill in the first place. However, I have not had a chance to look at the amendment, so this may or may not be the case. As far as the bill status goes, well, it looks pretty good unless it has to go back to the House and then... There may be some monkey business regarding the Huffines Amendment. So let's take a quick look at the bill history. As I said before, a committee substitute in the House made it nearly identical to the Senate version. Now, it was amended three times during the second reading in the House. It was amended two times during the third reading in the House. It was passed out of the Senate committee, and when it was passed out of the Senate committee, there was a change to the bill which essentially stripped the, well, it essentially stripped the Dutton Amendment from the bill. Now, the second reading in the Senate was today, which I'm recording this today, and I'll probably go ahead and release this probably first thing Saturday, and by today I mean Friday the 22nd of May. So it'll probably, this episode will probably be released on the 23rd of May, which is a Saturday. But on the second reading, the previously stripped amendment was added back and this was done by Huffines. Now, the third reading in the Senate was also on the 22nd, and the bill passed the Senate on the third reading, and barring any problems caused by the Huffines Amendment, the bill can now go to the governor's desk. Huffines indicated that his amendment was identical to Dutton's, but there are some reports coming back that it is not quite the case. So let's take a quick look at the stricken and then re-added amendment. The House Amendment Preventing Certain Investigatory Stops and Detentions was stricken in the Senate State Affairs Committee. This same amendment was added back in during the second reading on the Senate floor. Now, in the House, this was the Dutton Amendment, but in the Senate, it is the Huffines Amendment since it was stripped out and added back in. The intention of this amendment is to protect license holders who are openly carrying from being stopped and asked for ID and license for no reason other than openly carrying a handgun. Now, the case is that there's a chance that the Huffines Amendment is not identical to the Dutton Amendment. I don't know how true this is. The text isn't up yet, so I can't read it and see. But if it's not identical, House Bill 910 has to go back to the House for another vote, or it has to go into conference committee and be voted on by both houses. However, the amendment was added back into the bill after hours of debate and recess. This is like six hours that they were either debating or in recess and during that recess, they were, they were seriously talking about this bill. Now, Senator Huffman, not Huffines, but Huffman, offered an amendment to the amendment that would have increased the penalty for unlawfully carrying a handgun from a Class A misdemeanor to a second-degree felony. The Dutton and Huffines amendment was originally stricken due to comments, or the reason it was stricken is people were nervous about comments made by Stickland and certain open carry advocates, and these comments were viewed by many as encouraging people to carry without a license, meaning carry illegally. Additionally, concerns about these comments were supported by the apparent activities of a certain leader of a certain group when he was in Oklahoma last year. I'm not going to go into details on that, but if you listen to earlier episodes of this podcast when it was the open carry report, you probably know what I'm referring to. I referred to it as the Oklahoma incident back then, and now it looks like it may be coming back to as a bit of a pain in the butt. Now, as I said earlier, there was an apparent deal between the House and the Senate that required House Bill 910 to be passed by the Senate in exchange for Senate Bill 11 to be passed by the House. And the rumor that I've gotten, and by rumor I mean it is just a rumor, 
is that all this fuss about the Dutton Amendment was part of that deal. I don't know how true that is. I really don't care if it's true or not. I want both of these passed. If the Dutton Amendment had to be stripped out to get campus carry, then I'm not going to be a very happy camper if we don't get campus carry. But this is stuff that I have not gotten from any reliable source. This is stuff I have not gotten from... This is stuff I may not... I haven't got it from any of my usual sources. This is stuff that was kind of dropped to me through one method or another. And it's part of the reason that I didn't feel comfortable releasing another episode last week. Because I was wanting to... Or the reason I didn't release an episode last week was because I was wanting to see where this all went. Now, keep in mind, anything I've mentioned about any deals between the House and the Senate is all information that is of questionable origin, okay? It may be completely um, unreliable. It may be uh, a red herring that somebody threw out there. And then again, it could be uh, completely true and factual. But let me say, this information came to me through through a source that I have never received anything from in the past. This person has never been on the podcast. But if they are who they say they are, they are in a position to know a little bit about it, not as much as I would like, and I will not go into any further details than that. However, as it stands, it looks like we're going to have Senate Bill 11. It's in a precarious position because of what's going on. And the reason I'm kind of stopping and all, I'm reading through things on a website and a lot of it's confirming what I thought. And some of it is uh, kind of indicating the, the reported deal was the, may have been the case. I want to hold off going any further on that because, once again, this may not be entirely in my best interest to support this information at this time. But let me say, I'm going to drop it right here because there's more happening on this. And a lot of the information that's coming up now shows to be different than what I had on hand, but it doesn't, it doesn't conflict with anything I've gone over except for the information of questionable origin that I've already said, Hey, this is of questionable origin. And it doesn't really seem to conflict with that. So let me say, it looks like we got house bill 910. It's going to go to the governor's desk. If nothing happens bad to it. And this is assuming the Huffines Amendment is identical to the Dutton Amendment. If that's the case, we're good, we're golden. Open carry becomes law January 1st. However, campus carry may or may not be passed. we got to see what the House does. And we got a chance of getting it, but then again, we may not. Now, with that said, I think I've talked long enough. I'm going to go ahead and run the contact info, then we'll come back for the news. And then we'll wrap this episode up. And after that... We'll just see where, what we see. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Normally, I try to do three news stories, but this time I'm only going to do two. And there's a reason for that. That reason is because, well, I've been busy and nothing really stands out. Well, nothing but these two stories. Now, an administrator at Blinn College in, located in Bryan, Texas, told students they should not expect permission to exercise their First Amendment rights to support their Second Amendment rights because such free speech is too dangerous. No, this is the same logic that makes campus carry legislation necessary so that our college campuses are not target-rich environments for crazed killers. Many people think that, you know, guns and schools don't mix and that campus carry will be giving freshmen coming right out of high school, going straight to college, a handgun and a license to carry it on campus as soon as they sign their papers to go to school. And that's not the case. The eligibility for campus carry is a Texas concealed handgun license, which typically means a 21 years of age or older individual who has no criminal history of a felony, no class A or class B misdemeanors in the last five years, 
And this person has to be good stand in good standing with the state on a number of other issues. We're not talking about giving a crazed high school kid that's just getting away from home a handgun to carry around in school and, you know, start throwing hot lead because the cute girl sitting over there is flirting with another guy or a different girl than him. No, we're talking about licensed, responsible adults who have had time to com- to establish themselves. They've had time to mature, and they will be in these campuses. These could be people that are going back to college, maybe people who never attended college going and starting college after raising a family, and it could be people that are uh, 100% intent on, you know, postgraduate studies. There's a wide range of people that would be eligible to be armed, but we're not talking about 18, 19, 20-year-old students or 17-year-old students or, God forbid, 14-year-old students that somehow get into college way earlier than their peers. No, we're talking about licensed, responsible adults. And yet, colleges like Blinn College, they feel that constitutional rights, while they claim to be bastions of free speech and open-mindedness, they go out there, and if your viewpoint doesn't support their viewpoint, you have no rights on their campus. And this is a public facility. Lynn College is a public school. Well, at least that's my understanding. I didn't go back and research them, but I believe the article says they're public. But go to the show notes, click on the link, and you'll get, the, you'll get to read the article yourself. Now, the next article is just an article I found and threw in because, well, it kind of lets me segue into a little bit of a discussion on the event itself. Now, the shooting involving bikers at Twin Peaks in Waco, Texas, has elevated security concerns for the annual event held in Stur- held at Sturgis in South Dakota. Now, in Texas, this, more importantly, has, let, has caused increased tensions for law enforcement across the state. In Andrews, Texas, apparently one of the gangs that was involved at the Twin Peaks and Waco incident, some of their members were arrested at a, in the parking lot of a local business after they assaulted someone. Lubbock police on our alert, Odessa and Midland police, from what I understand, on our alert about these gangs. This is not good. In the last month, I have seen, I have seen uh, people riding bikes with the colors for both of these groups right down the U.S. highway, and it's, good Lord, I can step out on my front porch and easily read the jackets that they're wearing. Or not easily read it, but I can, because the patches are big enough, I can read them from a distance. I can recognize the jackets from my front porch when they ride by. I mean, I live close to a U.S. highway, but this is unreal. And both these gangs have traveled this U.S. highway right here close to my house, and nobody really understands it. The danger that these two gangs, or not these two, but all these 1% biker gangs represent. Keep in mind, motorcyclists are not biker gangsters. Biker gangsters may be motorcyclists. Now, some of them can't ride a bike without training wheels, but... They still like to wear the colors and pretend to be one percenters. And people like that are not people that can get a concealed handgun license. And this event was used to attack the open carry bill. And I guarantee you, if it happened to make the news when campus carry is being debated, it will not, (laughs) it'll be used to attack that too. Now, one of the requirements for a Texas CHL is that you are not part of a criminal gang. Cossacks, banditos, hell's angels, All these have been or still are criminal gangs according to the U.S. Department of Justice. There's a lot of problems when you have a gang and people are trying to use this gang activity to attack the most law-abiding segment of our population here in Texas. And that's a problem. At least to me it is. But you know what? I've had enough of this. I want to wrap this episode up. I want to get it out there. It's going to be a short episode. And after this... After the music, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to play something I played before. I'm going to play it again because it's important to keep in mind that we we are on the edge of legalizing licensed open carry in Texas. And there are going to be people that attack the bill, say, well, it's not unlicensed open carry. We gotta, we're going to pitch a fit. We're going to stomp our feet. We're going to hold our breath. And we're going to demand that we have licensed, unlicensed open carry uh, made law. Well, I want to run the audio clip that tells you why. 
unlicensed open carry is dead for this legislative session as soon as the, as soon as the sign off music is over with that said please stay safe and carry responsibly thank you for listening to the gun rights in texas podcast please leave a review on itunes or send feedback to the host your input will be used to improve the show stay safe and please carry responsibly on the bill. Representative Phillips, I appreciate your efforts on this bill. You know that I am a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. You know that I have been working very hard for open carry for Texans. We disagreed on the way to go about that. I was just curious on a personal level. I know that you have maintained that this bill was specifically about license holders. You know my argument is, is different and that we shouldn't have the license to begin with. Will you honestly work with me? Will you, will you give my bill a hearing in your committee so that we can have that discussion? You know that I am going to support your bill today because it's an advancement of Second Amendment rights, but there are literally tens of thousands of people who Mr. believe we Mr. need Stickland. to go to more. Will you work with me, Representative Phillips? Let me answer that. Mr. Stickland, uh, the fate of your bill was cast when the Senate decided they were not going to take up constitutional carry. I'm not going to argue with you. Your fate was treated as how you treated members on this floor as it related to your legislation and other legislation. It's also how those that support your amendment have treated members of this House, their families, and our staff that there is no reason when there's other members who've worked hard, who try to work with each other, they have to have a chance to have their hearing. They're going to get a hearing.